We may still have a few more signing on, but um, we will go ahead and get started. And um, I will just read a brief introduction of our presenter tonight and then um, turn it over. So like I said, thanks for joining us and welcome to our My Horse University and Extensions Horse Quest live webcast tonight titled How Green Is Your Farm? Our presenter tonight is Dr. Ann Swinker, Associate Professor in Equine Sciences and Horse Extension Specialist at Penn State University. Dr. Swinker has been involved in the horse business for over 35 years, and she began her career as manager of an Arabian horse stable in southwestern Pennsylvania. During that time, she was involved in breeding, training, marketing, importing, and showing a herd of purebred Arabian horses. From 1990 to 2001, she served as the extension horse specialist at Colorado State University and as a professor of equine science. Her research activities have addressed several management and environmental issues, such as stable air quality, small acreage management, composting and manure management, and water quality, in addition to behavior and re reproductive issues. She served on numerous extension, university, and professional society committees. Please note that you are able to ask questions during the presentation using the text chat to the left of your screen. And our questions tonight will be answered by Helene McKernan. She received her Bachelor's of Science degree in education from Lock Haven University and taught in both the private and public school system for many years. As an equine research associate at Penn State University, Helene presents educational workshops and presentations for both youth and adults in various project areas. She's provided education on the National Equine Identification System, Nutrient and Sediment Management Projects, and is currently involved with an upcoming program entitled Understanding Pennsylvania Farm Operations. The presentation today will be recorded and <clears throat> excuse me, uploaded to our website if you want to review it at a later date. And at this time, I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Swinker. Well, thank you very much, Amanda. Appreciate the introduction. Um, the topic I'm going to cover today I'm, I'm going to cover several things in addition to looking at some what we would call natural or holistic ways of managing a farm to kind of help the environment. I'm going to, by being a member of our state nutrient management advisory committee, point out some interesting information that you can use on your farm management wise in addition to some of the funding sources that could be available to farms or horse farms in certain states or communities. And we'll talk a little bit about those funding sources as we go through some of the management practices. But um, a lot of the horse operations are not aware of some of those sources. I'm gonna start off with something that most of you probably already know that the horse industry is probably the only animal agricultural industry that's, that's having any growth at all, and we're the fastest growing segment of the livestock industry. And a lot of you could argue, because our animals live to be 30 or 35, or that you know, different laws that have changed could have had that effect, but we were going that way before a lot of these laws took place. So, we are the fastest growing segment of the industry, and because of that, like some of the state conservation districts, EPA, our Departments of Environmental Protection for each state, and the NRCS, USDA folks who do regulatory things for farms related to contamination, non-point source pollution, and runoff of water, contamination of water, caused by animal manure, the nutrients in the manure. Now we're pretty interested in the horse industry because they're looking at us as managers of a, a very large land mass. Here in Pennsylvania, just to give you a perspective of that, there's 1.7 million acres that are managed by horse farm operations. And that's nearly the same size as the public lands, forest, national lands, state-owned public lands. So when you look at it from that perspective, our horse industry does manage a tremendous amount of land across the United States. So they're becoming very concerned with how we're managing manure, pastures, erosion. So these 
agencies are now taking a look at the horse industry, and in some states there are some matching funds available for incorporating conservation practices. I've got some websites at the end that we'll talk about, and also on the um, website at My Horse University, there's an article on environmental horsekeeping and is your farm green that goes through a little bit more about those programs that are available to horse owners. But no matter what state you're in, there's probably some regulations or laws that are taking place that are starting to include equine in these conservation programs. And along with that, we're also going to be regulated by law to do some of these conservation practices. So I'm going to real quickly start with some of the components to having good stewardship on your farm as your farm green. If you follow a lot of the topics we'll be talking about, it no doubt is a nice green farm, but water quality is probably the number one point that we're looking at um, as far as these regulations go. And the source of contamination actually is manure. And then along with manure also comes odor and dust issues. Um, whenever you have farms, animals, manure, you're also going to have mud and dust depending on the season. Right now it's pretty much frozen for us here in Pennsylvania, but in a couple of weeks we'll be back to mud. But along with, you know, looking at these three things, these other points come into play. Just balancing our ration. We're going to talk about how that increases your chances if you're not balancing your horse's rations of causing contamination to water sources more than you would have if, um, you know, you would have had a balanced ration for a lot of your livestock. Pasture management is very important because it does control mud and erosion. And then erosion control on our horse farms is much different than it is on other types of crops, dairy, beef cattle farms. Um, we do some things differently and we need to make sure that, that our agency people, the NRCS, conservation districts, EPA, all of those realize the difference about us. Then pest management, we're going to talk about some ways of controlling pests on your farm without really using harsh chemicals. Some of these, if we take care of these things up here, it kind of eliminates this one a little bit for us. And then overall, we want to talk about total farm balance. If you really want to have a green farm, you want to balance what's brought onto the farm, what's utilized on the farm, and what goes off of the farm. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end. But all of this kind of stems from water quality. There isn't anybody in the horse industry that denies that we all live upstream, downstream. We all utilize this water that flows um, that's in our groundwater or on our, our surface, you know, with ponds, streams, lakes, rivers. The last thing that we want to do is be contaminating this water source. And the agency people are very concerned about contamination from non-point runoff. And what we mean by non-point is if you have a pipe coming off of your property with a lot of drainage and manure coming through there and sediment and soil erosion, that's point source as to where it's going. But generally, non-point kind of filtrates through, ends up downstream. And this is the thing that most of those agencies are concerned about with our management. The key thing that we want to prevent is what this poor fellow is dealing with here. Um, you can see he's done all the wrong things. He's built his place where there's drainage. He doesn't have downspouts that are working. He has his livestock turned out in the lowest possible point, driving heavy equipment through there. So he's causing a lot of sediment that's mixing with the manure, with the nutrients in the manure. This flows downstream, and it has a detrimental effect 
on aquatic wildlife in the streams and ponds, and eventually back to the environment and us. This product also can leach down into groundwater, contaminating wells for both you and your horse, or for a community downstream that utilizes that water source. Um, we also know that, you know, especially this time of year, that can cause animals to become chilled and to horses and people slipping an injury is also, you know, a, a real problem. But the most important thing is it does violate the clean streams laws that affect almost all of the state, you know, all states in the United States. So we have to keep track of this kind of information. I'm going to keep referring back to a Penn State study and some of the results. But on average, an average 1,000-pound horse produces 9 tons of manure a year, or about 40 or 50 pounds per day. That's including water in the manure. But when you add in a couple of bags of shavings, that gives you a lot of extra cubic feet um, mixed in with the, the horse manure. So how much a horse produces in a year's time is quite tremendous. The average fertilizing content of horse manure, and if, if any of you've gone to the store and bought a bag of fertilizer for your home lawn, you remember there's three numbers on there, like a 10, 10, 10 fertilizer. So the first number is your nitrogen, how many pounds there'd be in a ton of that product. There'd be, you know, your phosphorus and your potassium. So if you were buying this horse manure in a bag at like at a garden center, probably straight horse manure would be like a 10, 10, 10 product. But when you add in the urine, feces, and bedding, it kind of changes it a little bit with the urine in there. It increases the nitrogen to about like our study came out showing it was almost 13, 8, 17. A lot of book values on average consider horse manure like a 12, 5, 10. So to find out for sure what your manure pile consists of, you can do a compost, a manure compost soil test to determine what the nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus levels are in your particular manure. But on average, this is what we're seeing with horse manure. So why worry about this problem? It contaminates the environment. We discussed that. Horse manure left unmanaged can spread parasites creates a mucky mud situation, fantastic breeding site for insects, can cause skin and hoof problems, it wastes a lot of space storing it, it's unsightly, causes odors and dust, and number one, it, it's now there's a law that possibly in your state will be enacted or is enacted as to how you need to manage your manure. The other thing, we want to keep clean water that comes onto our place clean. And most water comes on the place in the form of rain. So we really want to install downspouts and gutters. You want to control where this flows. It's ideal to do this underground with some, some ag piping underneath that lets it drain out and control where the runoff goes. Try to keep, you know, downspouts and things from running through your horse livestock area. You want to move that water out of there. Just here's a nice general rule of thumb to install roof gutters on like a 30 by 30 barn to um, remove like a one inch rainstorm produces almost 550 gallons of water. So you need to, you know, a little bit of money into putting downspouts, getting that clean water through the barn and out of the area. Another way you, is per, like how you drain the buildings away from the topography where you've built it. You may have to put swales that control the runoff to keep it from going through the barn and then it 
where it goes down, you need to be really careful you don't have livestock in that area tearing it up and causing a lot of mud. Um, this is, they you know have it going underground away from the barn. So there's different things you can do to kind of control that, clean, keeping that clean water clean and getting it moved away from your animal handling systems, your paddocks, your corrals, your rings. This one's pretty straightforward. In a lot of states, you have to fence livestock away from bodies of water, away from streams, ponds, waterways, drainage areas. And you can see these horses right here, kind of looking over the fence into the pond, and they're contained in their pasture and holding areas here. Horses traditionally aren't the species that kind of wallow in water. We do have a couple horses that like to get in there and splash, but it's kind of rare. They don't seem to hang out in the water like cattle do, but we're still covered in that livestock regulation that's asking to keep animals out of this area. And so if you have a situation like this, they're recommending, you can see they have hot wire here that wasn't enough to keep the animals out. There are some cost share programs with the NRCS that you may qualify for depending on your county and availability, how much money they have and if you're in a sensitive area. Um, they've done an improvement here where they've put gravel and kind of retained this stream a little bit, some stream bank improvement, fenced off the streams, made an animal tractor crossing that you can get from one place to the other, but you don't disturb the whole stream. So these are um, some things that we qualify for. Another major use of water where we can cause a lot of contamination Horse folks use a lot of water with their wash racks and wash areas. And these are just some photos of some ones that we've come across visiting farms. But once this water leaves this area, goes down this drain, in this case, this is the drain, well, you know, it's real imperative to figure out and manage that water once it leaves the place. But there's different things that you can do when building um, a wash rack that prevents erosion or water contamination. You can put in a permeable footing. A lot of the, there's some permeable concretes that could be put in that just has little holes that the water drains through. Some people use the larger popcorn asphalt macadam products that lets water drain through. And then they have like a French drain built under that with some drains. But wherever that water goes, um, you know, if it's draining outside, you may want to even consider planting a rain garden that's located actually even where your downsprouts are or where the drainage area for your shower stall drains into. Uh, these can, they have a lot of, they have gravel underneath it and plants that utilize a lot of moisture. Even contact your county extension office to make sure that you're not putting in toxic plants if you're going to plant a rain garden. And that's something that the family can participate in. It's kind of fun to do as to what you'd plant. Other things that you could do around the farm is put in French drains to contain water runoff. When you want to properly construct, you notice they have a little bit of drainage off the side of this road of the driveway. They're controlling. It's a grassy area that will absorb a lot of the moisture. So you want to contain and figure out where you're going to have that drainage water go to keep your clean water clean. Some other things you could do is plant trees. Trees drink up a lot of water around a horse facility. A mature Douglas fir can drink 100 to 250 gallons of water per day. These evergreens even continue drinking water on cold days like we're having here in most of the eastern part of the United States. And another thing that's key if you're planting trees, you want to make sure that they're fenced away from the horses to make sure they can't hurdle them, um, causing death to the tree. So, um, you know, planting trees on your facility not only 
causes, you know, to use a lot of the drainage water. It also gives wildlife um, a good environment to live in. It attracts birds that will help eat the insects that um, kind of contaminate the place. Other things like mosquitoes and that kind of, you know, it's just a nice environmental thing that we can do. The quality of our pastures really kind of shows how green your farm is, how well you respect the land and good, being a good steward of the land. So it's also the most economical, easy way to feed livestock and horses. So owners have several options when grazing horses that want to kind of cover right now. But we need to consider the grazing behavior of a horse. Horses graze very close to the ground and they can pull and tear up grass. They're very selective. They're spot grazers. They'll eat one place down to the ground. Another section will be a, a foot high and they continue going after the short grass. That's just kind of a behavior thing with the way horses graze and the short succulent grass tastes a lot better than that older mature grass. So there's some management things that we need to do to control that. The other thing is that um, they graze for long periods of time. They can continually graze for 10 to 14 hours where other livestock like beef cattle have to stop and ruminate and rest from grazing that long a period of time. And a horse needs to graze if it's outside at least 2% of its body weight. So a thousand pound horse has to graze at least 20% dry matter, not moisture. That means if you dry the grass, it needs 20 pounds. So the water is in addition to what it's taking in. So they need a tremendous amount of grass, but it's not unusual for one horse to eat two and a half to three or 4% of its body weight and become very obese on continuous grass if that horse is not being used or growing or reproducing. But let's talk about some of the grazing systems for our continuous grazing critters. Um, if you had, say this is a 10 acre paddock or corral or pasture, the, you know, if you had five horses and they're turned out in this 10 acres, they're not going to uniformly graze. They're not going to use all of that. And they tend to put the manure in one area and they don't come back there to graze for a long time. So the best thing to do is have use what we call rotational grazing. And this is a good example. You know, our same 10 acres is divided into four grazing cells. However, with horse folks, we would tend to put one horse here, one horse here, one horse here, maybe two horses here, which doesn't allow that grass to recover. Um, the idea of rotational grazing is you put all five horses in this area, then when the grass is grazed down to like four, you know, three to four inches, you move to the next grazing cell for maybe another couple of weeks then you move them to another one and another one. And then by the time you came back here, it's probably 30 days later and the grass had recovered and is ready for another harvest. We have to start looking at our pastures like we do crops and we need to harvest it. You can go down to a very intensive grazing system, which we see down here where this 10 acres is divided even more tightly. But the problem with that is all five horses in this tight of an area may not get along. So we only recommend intensive grazing for folks whose horses get along. So if you're in a boarding stable where there's continually different horses and pecking orders, they can't all go outside at the same time. So you have to do some different arrangements, but we can use a less intensive rotational system and be able to utilize our grass and keep the grass healthy, keep the place looking good and green. That helps with less erosion and contamination, and it more uniformly spreads the manure out in our fields. Another thing that we want to consider with pastures, a really good pasture is 
made up of very pell pelletable, desirable forages or grasses. These grasses are very vegetative. There are very few weeds, very dense sod, meaning the plants are close together, very thick, like very good solid footing. They're well drained. We provide clean, fresh water at all times, possibly shelter when needed, or at least a windbreak, some trees that they can get out of the weather. And we want it free of dangerous things like loose boards, bob wire, junk out in the field, abandoned vehicles, and particularly poisonous weeds. For some reason this spring, we've seen a lot of death and poisonings to livestock in pastures. I think it was because our growing season was so extended. Another thing we really want to consider too is proper, properly fenced pastures. And if you have yearlings and weanlings and two-year-olds, you probably can't get away with one strand of hot electric wire um, or a temporary fence or poly wire. Um, you have to use more substantial fence to kind of help those young animals um, not get hurt or injured in the process of trying to provide a pasture and grazing for them. So there's some considerations depending on your operation as to what kind of fencing you're going to use or what grazing and systems you're going to use. But all of us need to consider our stocking rates. And a stocking rate is the number of animals per acre that are allowed out on a pasture to make sure that it's not overgrazed. And this is an example right here of a horse that was left in a grazing cell too long before it was moved. But that's kind of a um, cartoons a little bit more than what we want to be looking at. But when we consider stocking rates, generally in most eastern parts of the United States or places where there's natural rainfall or you have artificial irrigation or you have irrigation water that you can put on a pasture to control its growth, usually one horse and one acre. But then there's other circumstances that can cause this to change. And that's how much rainfall you have, what time of year it is, how big that particular horse is. And that can actually range from a half an acre all the way up to 35 acres per horse. Um, there's a lot of semi-arid climate. When I was in Colorado, some of the farms on the west slope of Colorado and out west, one animal unit or 1,000 pound horse really required 35 acres of grass in order for it to meet its nutrient um, requirements for that particular horse. So we need to manage these pastures to prevent it looking like this in the summer. Hopefully this is a picture in the winter. But ideally this is what we want. However, we have to consider fencing these horses out of this stream. But we want to mow our pastures to kind of keep the grass down to four to five inches. You can keep it up to six inches is kind of healthy. We want to harrow fields breaking up the manure piles pretty regularly. That helps prevent parasites. It kind of breaks the cycle up. But we've got to remember when you first break those lumps up before the ultraviolet light gets to those manure piles, you're spreading the parasite eggs. So if you're rotationally grazing, you moved away from that field, then you harrow, or you could use your brush hog to mow, and that'll spread the manure pulse also. But if you don't come back to that area for more than 30 days, you're probably breaking that parasite cycle. And that's kind of just a natural way of kind of helping that. You want to apply fertilizer or composted manure, not fresh manure, onto pastures according to soil test. However, if you're spreading fresh manure and you're not going to be back on that pasture for a while, that's a nice management scheme too. However, if you have weanlings or yearlings, the askard parasite, you hope you never get, that's just a nightmare. That's a parasite whose 
egg can survive in the soil for 10 years. It can freeze. It can, you know, other than composting to hot temperatures, it's very difficult to get rid of that particular parasite. So you want to work with your veterinarian to control that one. There's not many holistic things you can do or management things to control that. But going back to your pasture management, the most important thing you could do is soil test. And you want to soil test your pastures every th three to four years. And if you have several acres on one hillside, manage the same. You could do a composite soil collection of several of those paddocks or corrals or pastures. It's interesting, in the east they call them paddocks, and in the west they call them corrals, but they're the same thing. They're grazing cells of pastures or holding areas. Again, um, going back to your soil test, the soil test will come back telling you your phosphorus, potassium, and your pH of your soil. It'll tell you if you need to lime. And it'll give you a recommendation for nitrogen, but it's very difficult to measure nitrogen in the soil because it dissipates and changes so quickly. And that's why they're so worried about it in the soil because it moves into the water quickly too. But you can get a soil test kit from a commercial company or your local county extension office. They range anywhere from eight to $12, generally about 10. And um, they may ch charge you some shipping to get the envelope and, and the, what you need shipped out to you. And then you send that you take that sample and you send it in to the cooperative extension or the university and they'll get your results to you in 10 days to two weeks. When you take your sample, you want to go down to root level. So that means you want to go down four to six inches, maybe eight inches. So you want to collect that soil where the root levels of the crop that you're going to be growing, which for us is grasses. So that's, and you want to take multiple samples and you don't want to put the manure or grass in the sample, you want the soil. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, like going back to our rotational grazing or our layout of our particular farm. This is the barn the water source. This is a hard prepared sacrifice area, paddock, holding corral, whatever you want to call it, depending on what part of the country you're from. And then these are the grazing pastures, grazing cells that this particular farm is going to rotate. The nice thing about this is, like say you have a gate right here, you leave the gate open, the horses could go into the holding corral, get a drink of water, maybe go into the shed if it's windy or cold, or go back out and graze. Then when this field is grazed off, we close the gate, and we go to number two, open that gate. They have access to the water, the shed, the hangout area, and then they graze this off. And then after that, we move them, open the gate to number three, and a couple weeks later, we open the gate to number four. They can go through this alleyway up here get the drink of water, and so forth. And then we come back to number one, this corral, probably more than 30 days after we get out of number five. So this is a nice little layout for this particular farm. They use this common area, or what they call a dry lot, have a use area that doesn't have grass. And then let's say it's really winter, very muddy, they close all of the gates, close the gate here, and the horses have to hang out in this area for exercise or be put back in the barn. So it's a nice kind of a layout, but putting this sacrifice area in is real key to helping to manage a, a, a facility. The other thing that's real important is the ground cover. And the species of grass that you're going to grow on your particular farm will vary by your soil type, your climate, and the location you are in the United States. And um, ideally, we want to see a lot of ground cover. We don't want to see bare ground. We want a high percent of um, coverage on these places. And then we add in our grazing cells. And the fencing depends on you and your management, what works on your place. 
whether you want temporary fence or you have to have permanent fence because you have horses that are a little more aggressive and get put through the fence. So that'll vary on what you particularly need. The other thing that people also do is hourly turnout and not continuously grazing like we do with other livestock. And they'll maybe, you know, put horses out in this field during the morning hours, the heat of the day, they put them back in the barn or they put them out at night or they have different horses in this field and they go back in the barn. And that actually works out well too, because that way you're, you're prolonging the grass in this particular field. At times you may have to fence some of it off. Um, you can see on this farm, they have temporary fence here that, that's to keep the horses out of this area because they just receded. That's something you may have to do too. But this is what you don't want to see is a lot of bare ground that causes a lot of erosion and um, your place looks kind of sloppy and environmentally that's not the thing we want to do. The other thing is um, undergrazing. You can see this particular horse is elbow or even shoulder deep in grass, but and it looks lush and wonderful, but when we went into this particular field, we noticed that there was a lot of bare ground done underneath there because the grass was overgrazed or um, it was underutilized. There was a lot of shading and some of the desirable grasses were shaded out. So you would, however you manage your horse, you could see a little bit of bare ground on this particular site that it's being a little overused. They might be better off to divide that paddock and utilize that grass more evenly and stop some of the grazing when we're over, over grazing the area. Now back to those confined sacrifice lots. You know, we want our place to be attractive. We don't want a mud hole or a dust hole. But whenever you can find animals, you're going to end up with some manure that's generated. So it in increases the management that we're going to need on this particular facility. And this is, we definitely don't want to have a sacrifice area that looks like this. We're more interested in having one that, you know, looks more like this, that's comfortable for the horses that won't cause, um, fungus or dermatitis or scratches or rain scald or anything else to our particular horses. So how do we do that? How do we construct this hard surface in our sacrifice areas to make it a dry lot? Generally what we do, um, we start with the bare ground. We remove any manure, grass or topsoil or humus. Geotextile fabric is used a lot in road construction. It's also used a lot with um, uh, landfills line a lot of their sites with that so that things don't penetrate through into the soil. Then you want to come back with like 2B or you know with about four to six inches of an aggregate rock and then um, depending on where you're located here in Pennsylvania, we use a lot of lime screenings. It's kind of a finer limestone that we pack down over top of the aggregate rock top with this finer stone. And then we top it off with like a, what we call a softer, hoof friendly layer, which is just, this is kind of like wood chips that um, we were putting down there. Whatever you use, any wood products you use, you want to be really careful, especially in the Northeast, that you're not getting black walnut or any toxic wood substances to put on top of that. That'll cause some toxicity to your horses. And then you want to surround these corrals with vegetative grass or shrubs or something to filter out the runoff water. So when you're constructing this sacrifice area, you know, you want to kind of lay it out so that it drains away from the buildings and barns, that it's filtered through like a nice vegetative area. And, you know, you start with those layers of aggregate rock. And here's some examples of what we call sacrifice areas. And some are 
well done and some aren't. One we have down here, you can see that they do have the limestone screenings. This particular one, um, they did some nice drainage away from the barn, but they don't have a finished surface. So I'm sure if it was a pretty muddy day, these horses would be standing in pretty deep muck. Um, here's another one that's just a little corral around a barn. They have a lot of manure built up in there and grass, but it drains well. And it's on a type of soil that didn't require much addition to it or change to the surface. But the basic management, whether we're looking at fly control, rodent control, cleaning up the barn, nutrient management is just clean your stalls, pick up the manure in the paddocks and pens in your dry lot areas. This helps break the parasite cycle, helps water and, and erosion issues. And once you pick up that manure, you have to handle it and manage it. Study that we finished here at Penn State, we surveyed the horse managers that we conducted operations at their farms, and we noticed that 53% of most of these operations had manure removed off the property as soon as they had it removed from their stalls. But we worry about the other 50% of the people, and we hope they just don't let those manure piles be unattended to and just kind of piled up on the farm. But you need to consider a nice manure storage area. You have to have a dry spot that's well drained, that's not like at the bottom of the hill near a water source. You definitely have to keep it away from water sources or your wellhead. Probably one of the saddest cases I was called in on was a farm that had water contamination. They couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And then we noticed that the wellhead was in the same location as their manure pile. So they were contaminating their own water source. So this is something you want to consider. When you build an area like this, easy access for your tractors and spreaders and trucks to come in and out. You want to kind of confine the pile so that you know you're avoiding any runoff and then you want to make sure that you have trees and grass and things growing around that area to prevent runoff and utilize it and key thing is wherever this is going to this manure piles keep it 200 feet away from any ponds river streams and particularly your wellheads that's very important to keep from contaminating your own water source and there's all sorts of designs. Some are more primitive than others. Um, it can be just a hard surface following the same recommendations that we came up with for your sacrifice area. You can just do that hard surface area and store it on that site. If you do it on bare ground and it's not a prepared area, some states will require that you remove that manure and have the manure located in another location every two years. Not sure what the science is behind that, but it's the law here in Pennsylvania, so we do consider that. The other thing you want to do is compost your manure. To do this, you need carbon and nitrogen. The bedding and hay and sawdust is your carbon source. The manure and urine is your nitrogen source. And then all you need is a spot to do it in, Moisture and oxygen, let the microbes do the rest. So you want to properly compost manure and heat it up to 145 degrees Fahrenheit. This will kill parasite eggs and weed seeds. Weed seeds are probably the worst thing about horse compost that gardeners don't like. But you want to pile it up about three to four feet or five feet high. You want it in a windrow, you want to make a long windrow that's piled up that high. And what that does is the oxygen will come in and then it has this chimney effect where it releases the heat and um, the other nutrients stay here. The microorganisms will kind of break this down over time. And the optimum thing you need is carbon to nitrogen and horse people really have a lot of bedding and hay so we have a lot of carbon and ratio to nitrogen which is our manure and urine so we're really um, 
we meet that, or at least 30 to 1, 40 to 1. Sometimes we have to add a little bit of um, fertilizer to that to increase our nitrogen content. You want to keep it about at 50 to 65 percent moisture meaning if you reached into the compost with your hand, it would feel like a ringed out sponge. You won't want it drippy in your hands. Um, the oxygen, we need about five to 10% oxygen. So that means you have to turn that pile. You can't let it be stagnant because then it encapsulates and some of that manure you put in there several years ago will look exactly the same when you go to get it out. So you didn't really compost if you don't have oxygen for the microorganisms to utilize the nutrients in that manure pile. The pH needs to be um, acceptable, like around a 5.5 to an 8.2. You want to start with smaller particles. You don't want to be composting logs in your manure pile. So most of the particle sizes need to be small. And you try to keep that temperature between 110 and 160, 160 is pretty high. It kills a lot of the good microorganisms that are doing the composting. So again, we need oxygen for compost to happen, to raise the temperature. And um, again, this is pretty high, but you know, I, you know at, at 50, things are starting to happen. When you get this high, you might be killing off the good bacteria, but you wanna at least get that temperature, and you could buy one of these thermometers to measure your manure pile at any lawn garden center, but you want to get it up to at least 140. That kills a lot of the weed seeds that we're worried about. And um, Remember that the heating up of the compost pile is due to microorganisms and microbial activity going on in that site. One of the new things that we're seeing, you can see there's a carcass in this pile. Um, a lot of the extension offices have information since we are having a real problem with disposing of dead animals and carcasses. There's mortality compost management that's kind of new. That's something we're gonna have to consider. There are some folks starting businesses that way where they're hauling off dead large animals to dispose of them that way. But we need to properly, whatever we did compost, we need to properly dispose of that manure. And generally using it in our hay fields, crop fields, and unused pastures is a good way to get rid of it. And it also is very good for the soil. It adds in a lot of organic matter, especially if the previous owner of our property let a lot of erosion happen to our topsoil. The other thing is you want to develop a manure management plan. Depending on the state you're living in, like Pennsylvania, starting next year, you have to have a manure management plan on fowl at your farm. And that's through our department, our DEP is requiring that of anybody that owns one animal, 500 animals. If you have, um, a very large operation, a confined animal feeding operation, you have to pay somebody to come in and, and do a manure management plan for you, a nutrient management plan, a whole farm balance plan. So in, if you have one animal or any livestock, in, in certain states you're gonna be required to have a manure management plan. You could contact your extension folks or NRCS to help you develop that. There's a lot of folks who are really interested in, in really well-made compost. A lot of landscapers, gardeners, some of maybe even your boarding customers may want to take some of this home. People use it in their riding arenas as a footing. Um, it's a nice, soft, cushy footing. However, sometimes if you do that in your indoor arena, kind of has a bad smell, but not only that, but the dust particles also carry that bacteria it could cause respiratory problems, not only for the horses, but the people too. We did a study when I was at Colorado about that and the, the inst riding instructors that work primarily indoors and smoked had like a 75% chance of getting 
bacterial pneumonia or rhinitis than folks who didn't smoke and who worked outside. So it, it is a hazard to our people in addition to the horses to do that, but it does make a nice footing outside, Gets tends to get a little bit wet, holds moisture. So it depends on what you're trying to do with your ring, whether you want to use your manure out there or not. Another thing that we really noticed was in a, that Penn State study that we did is that most horse people are overfeeding nitrogen or, or your protein, because remember protein is nitrogen and phosphorus in their horse's diet. So you should balance your diet to reach the National Research Council's equine nutrient requirements. And don't let your feeding go way over what the maintenance level horse ration should be for the NRCs. So it's good for you to every once in a while balance your rations, test your hay to see if there's enough nutrients in that hay that you maybe don't need all those supplements to really cause a lot of nutrients to go out in urine and manure and contaminate water sources on your particular farm. You might be able to cut down the amount of contaminants going on the pastures or into the water streams just by managing your horse's diet. And there's also the NRCS has a precision feeding program for horse, well, for livestock owners right now, maybe horses in certain states, where they'll actually pay you to pay close attention to this and not exceed the nutrient requirements of your animals. That's a new program that came out this year. Another thing we want to pay attention to is erosion. Wherever we have drainage areas, we need to control the flow of that, make sure that there's vegetative cover, um, or like where we cross streams that we don't cause a lot of erosion, like we're seeing in these pictures. Pay attention to drainage on your place. Even your, your outdoor arenas can cause a lot of damage. You may have to do some extra management to retain some of that aggregate that you're trying to use or your footing. So pay close attention to that too. We had one farm that was called in um, and reported that they did send some agency people out and actually the sand out of the arena was eroding down over the hill onto a highway. So that's considered the same as erosion and moving nutrients off your property. So key thing is um, for owners, like what does seem to be the right thing may not be. And if you look in these pictures, you can see where the manure is stored in a poor location. There's a stream right here. Um, you know, the whole place is your dry lot. That's really not acceptable. No, you know, you can see where there's a lot of erosion on this farm with no downspout. So kind of control some of these things. And something else that we want to consider too is insects. Um, if we remove manure, we eliminate a lot of pests. You want to like get rid of standing water that cause a lot of breeding sites for mosquitoes. Um, another thing is that you may want to combine environmental, biological, and chemical control, control methods to kind of manage your, your pest problems. You could even do things like plant certain ornamental plants that will attract insect-eating birds that will help control some of the insects also, or even bats. You may want to, you know, entice bats onto the property. They kill a lot of evening mosquitoes and insects. But some of the things for fly management, which is our major pest, there again, clean up the manure. Don't let vegetation take over the whole place, keep the grass cut, control where the higher vegetative plants are, clean up spilled grain. This will eliminate a lot of rodents and bugs. Screening, you know, putting screens in on the stable in certain locations will help control this. Keeping bugs off the horses, maybe stable them and provide shade during peak activity periods or, hot, you know, when the hot sunny days hit, the insects come out, so maybe don't have the horses there. 
We can use hormone traps. The only thing you'd want to put your hormone traps away from where you want the insects to be. I used to say when I was a county agent to it, like, you know, if you had a neighbor you didn't like, you could put the hormone trap over there by their property, then the insects go over to their place, not yours. The other thing you can consider is fly predators, wasps. Um, if you're going to use any of these fly predators or parasites, you can't be using a commercial insecticide in that same location because they're insects too and you'll end up killing the bugs and the predators or parasites that you bought. So at times you are going to have to use a premises spray and repellents on horses. Um, you could do little things like don't use perfume products, use biodegradable. There's nothing wrong with rinsing the horse off with a little bit of vinegar and a warm water rinse that helps repel it. I don't know why some of these products have all these perfumes in it that we use on livestock and horses because perfumes draw a lot of insects. So, um, you know, there's times where you have to use repellents on the animal itself. But if you're going to do that, I just want to bring up probably the main ingredient in a lot of our horse insecticides is pyrethrins, and pyrethrins are really a derivative of a flower, but it's usually mixed with some other chemicals too. So, you know, the marigold flower is usually with pyrethrins are a derivative of, but, you know, again, you have to look at what other chemicals are mixed in there too. But again, stay away from the heavy perfume products. You can do these things up above, and you don't have to use so much repellents and sprays. So you need to do all of the above. And if you're going to use these predators in the area where you have those predators, you definitely want to keep away from chemicals. Okay. So the next thing I want to bring up is odors. Remember, your neighbors are downstream. Um, you know, you want to keep friends with your neighbors, so you need to do some things. And actually, by planting trees, and the, the odor kind of depends on the surface area that it's going through or over your barn or manure site. Um, the topography, planting trees and shrubs kind of diverts a lot of that. It'll collect a lot of the odors. Actually, it utilizes some of them, and also it is a nice dust deterrent also. And dust is probably a new issue that we're going to be faced with, dust and odors. In some states, there's odor regulations. You have to have an odor management plan on your livestock operation or horse farm. And in some states, dust is as much of an issue as odor. But I'm going to real quickly just summarize. Um, each farm should have a plan at least a manure management plan and mud plan. Formulate your rations so you're not overfeeding nutrients. Store manure in a dry place that's level, free of you know, runoff, contaminating streams. Construct sacrifice areas to keep your pastures healthy and clean. Um, manage storm runoff particularly, you know, keep clean water clean. I'm going to throw this up because the NRCS is the, the agency that has these conservation plans that they actually will cost share or assist or pay you to do things like have setbacks of fencing on streams, also setbacks to allow wildlife to prosper in that area. Um, the state conservation district will be the one that will also have the nutrient management plans. EPA and EP are the ones that will be regulating a lot of this. But all of these have educational materials for you that can help out quite a bit. So I'm going to leave that up. We have a few minutes left for questions. Um, I see that Helene's been answering quite a few of them.
And um, okay, I see that somebody was asking a, quite a few questions on ants and eliminating ants out in the pasture. And I, I was just wondering, are these ants fire ants? They are fire ants. Those are a little bit more complicated. Um, I was going to say, what state, Claire, what state are you from? North Carolina. I'm going to suggest that you contact the North Carolina State University folks there. I don't know if you, you've heard of or know Bob Mowry, who's the extension specialist there that he, he will be able to give you specific chemicals or treatments that you could use in that area. Depending on how bad they are, you know, sometimes you can do some natural things to kind of control them, but you may have to resort back to some chemical uses. But we, if you're gonna do that, you have to follow the directions and label for that sp specific pest and you have to really be careful on storing those products, using them up on what they were intended to be used for. But um, I was going to say we can, if I was going to say if you want to email me or Colleen, we can get you that information or that contact at North Carolina State. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so they're gonna send that information to Helene and we'll get that information off to you. Fortunately, we don't have fire ants this far north, although they are saying that some of those are adapting to colder climates as they genetically change. Something that I didn't hit on um, was on rodent control. And actually, I mean, if you keep your feed locked up, the manure contained, do all those things we said, that reduces that, but there's nothing replaces a cat, a barn cat. Um, that's about as natural as you can get, unless you can train your border, border collie to go after mice. But, um, you know, that's still, having cats on the facility is very important. But if you have cats, you want them control spaying them, keeping them inoculated for different diseases. You want to manage those cats the same as you would a house cat, but they live outside. But you still have to take care of their health needs and their nutritional needs. I see we're just about out of time, and um, we'll wait just a little bit more if there's any more questions. Amanda? Yes. Um, I will... Uh, go ahead and um, conclude, but if any other questions come through, then you're more than welcome to interrupt me and answer those. But I just want to make sure I have a chance to say thank you to you, Dr. Swinker, for your presentation tonight and to Helene for answering questions. And, of course, to everyone for attending and participating in tonight's webcast. Um, yep. And I want to let you know that you will get, let me see if I can... You will get a survey by email in a couple of days, and if you can take a few minutes to fill that out and give us your feedback on the webcast, it will help us um, to plan for our future webcasts and just to give you um, and to better serve you. So thanks for your time in advance on that. And just to let you know about a few upcoming webcasts next month in January, we will be covering the topic of college and horses um, and different degree programs and um, careers regarding the horse industry. And in February, we will be talking about biosecurity on the horse farm. And in March, we'll be talking about gastric ulcers. So be sure to check our website for the details on those and to register. So thanks again for attending our live web presentation. And if you have any feedback or questions, you can feel free to email us at myhorseuniversity or info at myhorseuniversity.com. Um, visit us on our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. So thanks again. And this webcast will be recorded and uploaded to our website by the end of the week. Okay, thank you. We, I see we have one more question 
about very steep slopes and keeping erosion at bay. I'll be pretty serious. Um, like an 8% slope's pretty steep, and sometimes there's slopes that really shouldn't be pastured. They should be left in trees or shrubs or, you know, I'm not sure where you're calling in from. It sounds like a semi-arid climate, but um, sometimes, like out west, once you got grass established, if you damage that in any way, it could take 10 years to get back. Okay, British Columbia. So, um, do you